Welcome everyone to another episode of the YPod where we highlight everyday Wyoming leaders. Uh, incredibly excited to have a conversation today with Chad Brown. Uh, Chad is the co-founder of Pine Bluffs Distilling uh, in Pine Bluffs, Wyoming. Uh, Chad, thanks a lot for chatting with us today. Hey, you're very welcome. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me on and it'd be great to, uh, to chat with you today. Yeah, tell some of the Pine Bluff story. The, yep. Uh, the Pine Bluff story, though, putting that on pause for just a couple of minutes uh, and talking a little bit about the Chad story. I know you don't like to, you know, make it about you, um, but the journey that you went on to get from where you started to be in Pine Bluffs, I found really fascinating. Um, you didn't grow up in Wyoming. You grew up in California, didn't you? I did. I grew up in uh, Northern California, a small town called Quincy, California, uh, which is up by Lake Tahoe. Um, born and raised there and then I uh, went to went to college in Reno yeah the University of Nevada um, go Wolfpack and uh, after uh, graduating college I got a job with Enterprise Rent-A-Car and worked for them from 2001 through 2008 um, then 2008 became a casino investigator for the state of Nevada Gaming Control Board um, the investigation division and uh, did that for a few years and then did the same thing, but for a private company for uh, international game technology, IGT, the world's largest slot machine manufacturer. Um, so I did corporate security for them and, until moving out to Wyoming in July of 14. And was it a big decision for you to move to Wyoming or was it something that you had been wanting to do for a while? Um, it was something that my wife and I, uh, Wyoming, no. Uh, moving out of Las Vegas, yes. We've got three daughters and we wanted to raise our kids in maybe a more rural environment. So our, you know, our plan or thought was always we'd end up in Northern Nevada just because I have spent a lot of time there. Well, when the opportunity, I got a cousin, uh, Gene Purdy, um, one of the owners here too, uh, is a farmer in, in uh, Pine Bluffs. Uh, he came out to Vegas in 2014 and, and mentioned that, you know, maybe we could uh, grow some barley and uh, make malt and whiskey in Pine Bluffs and, so uh, Teresa and I packed up the kids in the minivan and a Penske truck and drove out to Pine Bluffs in July of 14 and haven't looked back. And you had some experience with not distilling, but home brewing before that. Yep, absolutely. So uh, um, I would, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought here. Um, I was home brewing in Vegas uh, with a good friend of mine, Pete Kimball. Um, we brewed uh, 15 gallon batches quite a bit. And then I also volunteered at uh, Joseph James Brewing Company um, where my buddy Alex was brewing there. Um, and that's where I kind of learned the whole fermentation of grains was, uh, was through home brewing, which is pretty cool. And other home brewers I've talked to over the years um, have a real passion for it for a variety of different reasons. But what was it about home brewing that attracted you to it made you excited about it so i kind of got into it and uh, we can thank my dad charlie brown for that um he was home brewing you know back in the late 80s early 90s before it was really cool and my older brother and i we thought he you know we had the crazy dad that would home brew and then you know we graduate college and we're like holy crap you know man pa was on to something um i'm a big foodie love to make my own bread and pizza and so instead of buying beer, you know, we were like, well, why don't we try and make it, you know? And so that's kind of where the passion for, for me came from. Um, so my dad kind of gave me the idea and then I just, you know, we took it from there. And the appeal of moving to Wyoming partially was your family. And in the slideshow, we'll get to see, see a shot of your family in just a little while. Yep. Um, also, there was the idea of the business aspect of what you were doing and you had put together a business plan uh, what was your what was your picture of what Pine Bluffs Distilling was going to turn into? You know, so um, our picture of what Pine Bluffs Distilling will become, because we're still we're still becoming what we want, um, is really to become a regional distillery, or you know, produce spirits in a town of twelve hundred people, you know, and get those spirits to fifteen twenty states down the road. Um, it takes time to get there though, because we keep filling barrels and we're not dumping a whole lot of barrels, but, uh, you know, we, we want to get people to Pine Bluffs, Wyoming, you know, a lot of people in Wyoming go to Fort Collins. Well, why can't people in Fort Collins come up this way? 
So, you know, if we can create an environment or a business that's unique, maybe we can do that. And speaking of unique, the, the group of people who came together to make Pine Bluffs launch um, w was really a testament to, I think, partnership and collaboration and just an excitement about what you guys were trying to do. Could you tell folks who might not know a little bit about how all those pieces came together to help you launch? Absolutely. Um, you know, so we had this idea in 2014, 2015, um, but there was not a building for us in Pine Bluffs to house what we wanted to do. Um, so we started working with the Wyoming Business Council through their BRC grant program um, and found out there could be funding through the state. They call it a grant, but there's no grant about it. Um, basically, the state would then build a building and turn it over to the Laramie County if Laramie County wanted to go on with it. Well, Laramie County wanted to go along with it, and so did Cheyenne Leeds, and so did the town of Pine Bluffs. So, yeah, we worked with the Business Council, Laramie County, um, Cheyenne Leeds, and then the town of Pine Bluffs to make this all happen. So our building is owned by Laramie County, and we lease it back um, and pay lease payments every month um, that goes against the grant funding that um, we got from WBC. One of the things that I, I loved when I first heard that story, um, and it's a, it's a great uh, serendipity piece in, in terms of Wyoming, uh, I first heard the story about Pine Bluffs distilling while I was in Paramount Coffee, <laughs> and, and John and Renee have also been guests on the Y-Pod, which is really cool. Um, and it just struck me how many people uh, had to be on board with the idea. And mm -hmm. it, we hear so many stories about bureaucra uh, bureaucratic hurdles and hoops that you have to jump through and how challenging it can be to work with different organizations. But at all those levels for those people to come together and help you guys get off the ground, I thought was a really uh, fantastic, positive story. Absolutely. I mean, it's very Wyoming, you know, it's let's all pitch in together and rising tides is just gonna make everyone, everyone, everything better. Yeah. Um, and pitching in, you do a great job of teaming up for, for things that I know have happened at Pine Bluffs. Um, you've had people kind of come out of the woodwork in order to uh, be a part of what you're doing, uh, which is a way to talk about what's behind you, yep. the mural that you have on the wall. Yeah, so when we opened in uh, 2017, I'll do a little, little mural vision here. Um, a gentleman came up to us, uh, his name's Patrick Cosner, and he asked, he's like, what are you gonna do on this, uh, this black wall behind me? And uh, we were like, oh, we're thinking maybe some type of, type of mural, we're not really sure. And he says, well, here's my business card and I'm gonna paint it. Um, that was November 17, he really got after it uh, in maybe say February, March. Um, and after 101 and a half hours, we have this wonderful mural, you know, thanks to the former uh, uh, Pine Bluffs High School art teacher. You know, he moved on to Riverton, but still a great guy. And um, if you Google Patrick Cosner art, you can see a time lapse of this mural being painted, which is awesome. And after you had mentioned it, I, I went on to uh, YouTube and watched the video. It's remarkable uh, to watch it happen. We'll include a link as well so people can get to it. Yeah, it's really cool to watch. Yeah, it was fantastic on the video and must have been amazing for you being in the building and actually watching it come to life. Absolutely. You know, uh, it was it was just great to see what Patrick would do every single day. You know, we'd let him in in the morning and he'd paint, you know, and it was just it's, it was really fun to watch. Well, we've talked a lot about Pine Bluffs distilling um, and we should show some folks around as well. On the screen, what is going to pop up is uh, one close-up view. Um, it includes um, some cutting in a piece of equipment. Maybe if we start, could you tell us what piece of equipment we're looking at? And then I'll ask you a different question. Yeah, absolutely. So we are looking at the inside of our spirit safe. Um, so we do a double distillation. And this is uh, after our finishing still. And uh, so that's the backdrop of our spirit safe where we collect all of the alcohol that comes off the still. Um, there's two chambers in that spirit safe. There's one for the heads and the tails. And then this is right above the, the heart's tank, which is a, a pretty big tank. And we'll get to see a different view of this. Part of what struck me about this photo when you sent it to me 
was a, it has a very artistic feel to it. Mm -hmm. um, the, both the way the photo was taken and then also the metallic aspect of it. Um, and the artwork that's involved, there's a very specific mentality behind the logo yep. that goes with it. Could you tell folks how you settled on that logo? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when we started getting design ideas for our company, you know, we really wanted to showcase that we were a grain to glass or soil to spirit company. Um, there's a lot of distilleries out there that can buy neutral grain spirits um, and then call them craft made or they can buy whiskey on the open market and add local water and call it Wyoming made or whatever, you know. Um, well, we wanted to show that no, we, we go from grain to glass and so that represents a wheat head or a barley head kind of in the shape of a glass. <clears throat> And the logo shows up a variety of places in the building. Um, also, it's not a part of the slideshow, but for folks who go to your Facebook feed or, or look at you on Instagram, you've got a lot of really cool swag that goes along with that brand as well. Yeah. Uh, so for folks who like it, there's a lot of cool stuff. Cool. Thank you for saying that. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, next photo is a shot from outside of the building, obviously. Yep. Uh, could you tell folks a little bit about what they see when they see this picture? Yep, yep. So, you know, what they're seeing is some wonderful uh, weedy sunflowers. But, you know, besides that, um, we've got our eight grain bins right there. And those uh, grain bins are where we store our corn, wheat, uh, rye, barley. Uh, we've got, I think, three different bins of barley just for the different varieties. Um, and then this year, we're also going to add triticale to that mix, which is a wheat rye hybrid. So that's what you're seeing there. Um, and then, yeah, there's our big warehouse looking building, um, on the front left side, that's our tasting room. Uh, so yeah. And we'll get to see inside in just a moment. Also, there's been an addition to the building you had mentioned. Yes. On that front side of the building, um, we added a patio, which, uh, you can hear our ceiling going up today, possibly as we're drilling through the uh, tin. Um, but yeah, we're, uh, we, we put a covered patio up. Um, out front and we're hoping that we get to have people enjoy that heading into this uh, this summer months. Can't wait to have a lot of people there once it's safe for folks to do. Exactly. Uh, this is your tasting room <clears throat> and this was a shot from before we had the lockdown just to give folks a feel for it. You can see the logo work in the back Yep. Um, and you mentioned tin just a couple of minutes ago. You, you said there was a story behind some of the tin in this room. Yeah so when we wanted to create this uh, this whole space, we wanted to really use, uh, use materials if we could. Uh, and we really liked the look of the rustic tin. So we, uh, we found a local farmer who had a, an old tin building, a tin granary actually. Um, <clears throat> it looked like it was about to fall down. So we said, hey, you know, can we take all that tin off that building? So the tin behind our bar there, you know, is probably 100 years old or something like that, which is, we thought was pretty cool to do. Yep. And folks may not be able to see it incredibly well, but when you look at the, the tabletops, they feel very much to me like um, wood and barrels and casks. Yep. Uh, did you find those existing that way or did you, it was that much work in order to track down something that had that feel? Yeah, so actually the tabletops, all, the, all those round tables you see, we actually made ourselves with, uh, with the help of a woodworker here in Pine. Um, those are old wire spools from High West Energy, our local nonprofit power company. Um, so we broke the spools apart. We sanded them down. Um, Craig Johnson here in town uh, ripped a one by two and bent that around the table just so it smoothed it out. And then for legs, we went back to High West Energy and got a bunch of old power poles and cut, cut the power poles down. And those are the legs for the tables. So you can see how old the, the poles are because there's climb marks all over them. You know, this is before, uh, before you know, they're, they're boom trucks. And actually that bar is recycled as well. Um, that bar is an old bowling alley. Um, <clears throat> so we were looking for a bowling alley bar and we actually found that, that piece. And we did some uh, asking and that came out of what used to be called, I believe the Cowboy South over in Cheyenne, which is now the Outlaw Saloon that used to have a bowling alley in there. So people from Cheyenne come in, we tell them that, they're like, well, if this came out of the Cowboy South, then I've bowled on it. 
What a strange uh, experience to be able to see something that you had been in the room with before in such a different way. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Well, and now when people do come out to the tasting room, it would be neat for them to have that piece of it. Otherwise, you might not know. Thanks for telling us those pieces of it. Yeah, absolutely. Speaking of barrels, could you tell us a little bit about, there are a lot of things going on in this, different kinds of barrels, different uh, ways it plays into your production. What are folks seeing here? Uh, so what they're seeing here is uh, uh, the front row of our barrels. Um, <clears throat> we actually have two rows of barrels heading that'd be east and west it's hard to see um but that front row is there's four i want to say four different types of whiskey in those barrels so we've got a a weeded bourbon uh so corn wheat and malt um then we've got a rye bourbon so corn rye and malt <clears throat> we've got a rye whiskey in there which is 70 percent rye 15 percent wheat 15 percent malt and then we've got uh 16 barrels of our five grain whiskey in there which is 20% uh, of each grain. And there is oats, rye, wheat, corn, and malt in that whiskey. So that's a whiskey that uh, we wanted to try and uh, we put it in the barrel, I wanna say January, February. So we'll find out how that is in a couple years, really. Um, that's actually something we were talking about before we uh, went live with this. There's an aspect of you thinking how something is is going to taste but you put it in a barrel and it goes away for years yeah absolutely um so all these 53 gallon barrels the the two bourbons they're going to sit in those barrels for at least four years um the rye whiskeys possibly we'll, we'll open them at two and see how they're doing uh rye can age faster than than other spirits um and then yeah that five grain uh, we think it'd be really cool to kind of do a vertical tasting on that um, and maybe open one barrel a year and just bottle that one barrel um, we've got 16 barrels, so we'll see how that turns out. So, you know, we think we know how grain tastes and then put it in a barrel and wait and see. And is is that something that you um, like better or is it just different than home brewing? Because in home brewing, you've got such a sor shorter period between when you brew it and when you can actually taste it. Yeah, you know, I don't know if I like it better. Um, it's a test of patience. Um, when we're home brewing, you know, we can know within two weeks if we have drinkable beer or not. Um, after we run the still and we run the finishing still, we know the product is good up to that point. We just may not know how the barrel is going to react to it or how the, the product's going to react with the barrels. Um, but typically, you know, the barrel is only going to make the product get better. So if we coming off the still are good, then man, we should be good going, you know, after a few years too. That idea that the barrel makes it better what changes you know a lot about the the chemistry of what's involved in the science and invo is involved in we don't necessarily need to do a deep dive into that yep. but in layman's terms why why does it sitting in the barrel make it better you know there is a lot of the chemical part that i don't understand about that but there is you know the barrels and the liquid do breathe in and out of the wood and go through that charcoal um so after we get done with the barrel if we were to cut those staves you know we could see how far the spirit went into the barrel and then back into the middle of the barrel. So it's constantly picking up flavors from the oak, you know, as, uh, as it ages. So, I mean, that's one aspect right there. And so part of your decision when you're looking at a particular spirit is not only the mixture of the spirit itself, but then also the barrel that it's going to go into. Absolutely. You know, and so all these barrels that we see right here are first use. Um, so the first time the product went, went in there was ours and they're all white American oak and they're all charred on the inside to a, a char number three or a medium char. Um, so all that goes into the kind of the thought process of what we're trying to make. And is that, uh, we'll see in just a few minutes, we'll, we'll see some of the other folks who are on your team. Is that something that you or someone else kind of takes the lead on or do you guys kick it around on, on each different product? We've kind of, we kind of just do it collaboratively, you know, we'll sit around um, <clears throat> having a cocktail, you know, and discussing, hey, uh, we've been using number three char barrels um, on some of our smaller barrels to, to make sure that we know what we're doing. Is it worthwhile changing it up, going to a four, which would make it darker or, you know, to a one or a two, you know, and currently we're kind of like, well, we're still learning. So why don't we just keep everything at a three? 
Um, but if we were to make another product, um, you know, maybe a corn whiskey would be better on a, a one char, you know, or who knows. So, but we definitely talked to our Cooper too, our Cooperage, which is Kelvin out of uh, Louisville and, you know, ask them for their opinions as well, because they've been in this business way longer than we have, which means they're way more knowledgeable. And the Cooperage are the folks who make the barrels themselves. Correct. Yep. All the, the amazing things that go into what you do. And then just as a side note, there's a whole business out there that just makes these barrels. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and that's a big business down in Kentucky. So uh, I can imagine it would be in Kentucky. Yep. So in your process, uh, you mentioned stills and, and distillery. Could you tell us what we see here? Yeah, so what we see here is our finishing still or our spirit still. Um, so just to the right, of, if we were to look from where this picture was taken to the right, there's another still. Um, so like I said, we do a double distillation. So we'll cook, ferment, run something through our first still, strip all the uh, um, ethanol and stuff off of the grain. Um, and then we'll take that liquid called low wines, put it into this still here. And then uh, this is where we get our finished product. So that very first picture that you showed uh, with our logo on the inside is on that piece of the equipment at the end of the, the three towers, there's a condenser, which we can't see. And then there's that spirit safe that I was talking about. So on the good part of that spirit safe, we can hold about a hundred gallons of liquid in there. So when we hear the word still people who aren't in the industry, lots of different uh, images come to mind, you know, uh, history channel, television yeah. shows, and things like that. Um, how much different is the technology that's here? Because it looks fairly space age. How, di how much different is this technology from home stills that, that we might've heard about? It's, it's truthfully not a whole lot different. Um, so it's hard to see, but on, a, on the left is our still, actually where all the liquid goes. And then on top of that, there's a whiskey helmet. Uh, most, uh, you know, let's say old school stills or even some Scottish stills. It's just a still with a whiskey helmet. Then the three towers kind of are, I mean, they're newish, um, but they, uh, it just offers us more flexibility. So that short tower is what we use to make our whiskey. Um, the two tall towers is what we use to make vodka. Um, <clears throat> each one of those sight glasses is a copper plate that causes resistance. The more resistance you have, the cleaner the product you're going to get because it's going to strip out the impurities, which is why we use the short column for our whiskey so that we can leave some of the flavor in there. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, uh, we, we talk a lot in, in this conversation about whiskey and, and that's most of what we profile. Um, but you mentioned in your vodka as an example, um, that's been pretty well recognized based on some of the stuff I've seen and people I've talked about that, that's gone over very well as well. Yep, it has. You know, um, we, we, make, we do make a vodka right now. It's currently 50% barley and 50% wheat. Um, we may switch that up down the road. Um, we'll see. But yeah, so we do make that as well. And then, but really, you know, long term, we're really going to focus on the, on the whiskeys and pushing, you know, different flavors that we can get out of that. And uh, with our location, you know, almost any small cereal seed can be grown here in uh, the surrounding area. So we really want to start using more of them, you know, like the oats on that five grain, um, triticale, like I mentioned earlier, that wheat rye hybrid, um, and just seeing what, what type of grains we can put in a barrel and see how it turns out. It's a great system to experiment locally. I like it, Chad. Yep. Speaking of your, your product and also the idea of experimentation, um, uh, I was stricken as I was looking through all your different products, um, this idea of Cheyenne Summer, uh, maybe because we've been in winter recently, Cheyenne Summer really jumped out at me. Um, and you said there's a, there's a lot of story behind the idea of Cheyenne Summer. Yep. So uh, the Downtown Development Authority of Cheyenne reached out to us, I want to say April, March, April of 2018, and asked us if we could create a whiskey to kind of celebrate Cheyenne Summer. Um, we let them know it doesn't quite work that way with a lot of brown spirits. You know, we said the only really true whiskey we could have by the summer would be a corn whiskey. Um, so we came up with this. I want to say it's 90% corn and then 5% wheat and 5% barley, or it might be 80% corn and 10 and 10, but it's at least 80% corn. Um, just a very mild whiskey. 
Um, it can mix with anything. So that's kind of where that, that product came from. And do I remember that Cheyenne summer is something that'll happen seasonally as you move forward as well? It is. Yep. So we did that, that version of the corn whiskey in 2018. We then aged some, um, corn whiskey called Cheyenne summer in 2019 as well. Um, there won't be a Cheyenne summer in 2020 just with everything that's going on and switching, you know, some of our production this uh, spring to other stuff. Um, but our plan is to bring it back in 2021 and, and start with the different, you know, different product line or not product line, but you know, different seasonal, um, type spirit. Well, it's, it went through my head when you said there won't be a summer this year. I think every winter we feel that way. Absolutely. <laughs> we might get warm. We'll see. Absolutely. And, uh, you mentioned that there was a version of Cheyenne summer, uh, that you aged a bit. Is that what we see in this picture? Yep. That's what we see in that picture there on, uh, just to the right of the barrel. Um, so it's just a lightly, uh, aged uh, corn whiskey still. Um, and then, yeah, there's our rye whiskey, Lodgepole Creek, and then single malt. Um, so, uh, that single malt is just nothing but Pilsner malt, um, and then aged two and used barrels. That's why it's pretty light and colored. Um, Lodgepole is, uh, our weeded bourbon. Um, and then this rye whiskey was our first crack at rye. Um, 54, 54% rye on that batch just to see how it was. Um, that is now all gone. So if you see it in the stores, that's, that's all that's left is what's in the stores. And some of the names seem to be very much tied to what it is. Rye whiskey, single malt whiskey, uh, Cheyenne summer has a theme behind it. Yep. Um, is there a story behind Lodgepole Creek? Um, we were uh, really tr trying to showcase where we are. Um, so we can see Lodgepole Creek from the distillery and Lodgepole Creek is actually the longest continuous Creek in North America. So I, I don't quote me. It's either like 400 miles or something like that of continuous Creek before it dumps into the North Platte over in, uh, Colorado or Nebraska. So if someone's looking for a, a tasty beverage, as well as a little bit of geography trivia. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you, you pull that out at your next social gathering and there you go. Yep. The longest continuous Creek in North America runs through Wyoming, starts in Wyoming. And do you guys, in, in terms of uh, coming up with the recipes, there's also coming up with the names. It seems like there's a very creative aspect to what you guys do. Yep. So as far as recipes, um, you know, so I homebrewed beer for quite a while in Vegas, like we talked about. Um, and then Aaron Mayer, our distiller, uh, he came to us from Daniel Marks Brewing over in Cheyenne. Um, uh, and then Michael Davidson, he homebrewed with me in, in Vegas, too. You know, we all understand or we think we understand um, the, how the grain flavors are going to react with each other. And, and uh, really, it's just let's try it out. Let's do a 500-gallon batch or two 500-gallon batches, run it through the still, and see how the, the clear spirit tastes. And you had mentioned, I think earlier, and also in a conversation that we had, part of what you're trying to do is pull out local flavors, local yep. ingredients. Um, why, why does that resonate with you? Why do you like that idea? You know, uh, yeah, it's very cliche to say, you know, you're local or whatever, but you know, for us in a, in a town of 1200 people, um, to bring some community pride to these farmers that, you know, may have just been farming for the commodity market for generations, you know, five, six generations. Um, well now, you know, our thought is, you know, look, they can take some pride in, in these products as well. Um, and the guys that, that grow for us and the families that grow for us definitely do take pride in that, you know, um, growing rye down here is kind of a four letter word. Um, it gets in with the wheat crops and no one likes that. So the fact that we've got a family that will grow rye for us, we're, we're pretty, you know, we, 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 we really appreciate that. So. I love that aspect of it, both the, the Wyoming pride and the Pine Bluffs pride and Speaking of community ties, uh, the first exposure uh, that I ever had to Pine Bluffs before I heard anything about your story uh, was one of these mini casts. Yep. Uh, I, was, I was at a chamber event and, and uh, they were raffling off one of these and a person at my table was lucky enough to win it. Um, and it's one of the only things I've ever seen at a conference or a meeting that people from other tables wanted to come over and look at it. 
Um, could you tell us a little bit about how you guys came up with this and what you do with it? Yeah, um, so this is a two liter little mini barrel. Um, and we thought these would be pretty cool to have in our tasting room. Um, people, you know, could come. So two liters is gonna hold uh, two and three quarters of a bottle. Um, and, you know, we'd fill them up or, you know, people buy three bottles in the little barrel and then they could drink, you know, on tap, you know, I don't know. We thought it'd be cool. Well, what these have quickly turned into is organizations have heard that we have these and uh, they've turned into quite the little auction or raffle item. Um, so we've probably donated 30 between, I want to say between 30 and 50 of these over the last year and a half, um, two different organizations for whatever fundraisers they've got going on. And do they, do they come in this size? Do you have to custom order them? Yes. Yeah, so I, I don't see these very often. No. Um, so the place that we get them from, um, I forget what it's called, uh, North American Barrel Company, maybe. They come in one liter, two liter, five liter, 10 liter. Um, we just thought the two liter was a, a good size. It sits on a bar nice. It sits on a home bar. It would look great right behind you. you know? <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, you can just turn around and just have a little, have a little shot of whiskey and then, you know, let it sit there and just keep, keep aging. Uh, that would, that would give the, the podcast a very different outcome. I think if, if we got into that. Absolutely. <laughs> And you mentioned earlier the idea that this year has been very different um, and that you had to change up and do some different product work. Um, and I actually misspoke. It wasn't that you had to. It was that you chose to. Yep. Um, when um, the, the novel coronavirus happened, the move to hand sanitizer, um, how were you guys thinking about that? And, and what did you guys decide to do to be able to help? You know, so it was one of those where I'd seen a couple other distilleries um, on Facebook or Instagram talking about doing it. Um, I want to say we got two or three direct messages from uh, companies around the area asking if we we're going to partake in that. Um, so we were, we were marching down that path to making hand sanitizer. Um, and then I got an email from Chris Baird, uh, who works for Weldworks, Weldworks Distilling, Weldworks Brewing down in Greeley, Colorado. Um, asking, uh, hey, are you guys going to make sanitizer? Us as a brewery, we can't make it, but we know you can. And if you guys are, could we, any way we could uh, help out and partner up with you guys so that we could uh, see what comes of this. So we jumped on that opportunity um, as quickly as we could. Um, Chris, uh, he works for Weldworks, but he lives in Cheyenne. You know, so uh, basically Weldworks um, offered to start buying um, the glycerin that goes in there, the hydrogen peroxide, helping on the bottles, uh, or now they're buying all the bottles, all the caps, all the labels, the packaging. Um, we make the ethanol, and uh, between Weldworks and us, we've uh, donated over 3,000 gallons of hand sanitizer um, across Wyoming, um, Panhandle in Nebraska, uh, all over Colorado. I think uh, Weldworks said they've donated to like 300 hospitals across, across Colorado. So we just donated to all the boys and girls clubs in the morning yesterday. So we got them taken care of for the summer. Um, yeah, post six baseball, we donated to them recently. So we're just trying to trying to help out. And how much of a of a change production wise is it to produce hand sanitizer versus to produce the product you normally produce? You know, so we're going to produce ethanol, which basically all of our products contain ethanol. Um, so we just went with the, the cheapest source of that for us internally, which is corn. So we did a 90% corn mix with 10% malt barley for the enzymes. Um, and then just distilled that to 190 proof, which is what the FDA guidelines specify. Um, and then we have a stainless steel mixing tank and we just would mix it all in there and then start bottling. So it really wasn't um, a big change for us. Um, but it was, uh, it's been pretty interesting, pretty fun. That's for sure. A, a whole new chemistry experiment for you. Absolutely. Yep. 100%. Well, and it, it also sounds to me um, similar in the, the case that you were talking earlier about community pride and uh, why you moved to Wyoming anyway. And, and so it seemed like a natural extension that you would get involved in something like this that helps the community. I'm thrilled to hear the list of organizations you guys have donated to. It's really good work you've done. Yeah, and I think we have a running list, and we're probably over, you know, here in just Wyoming, over 150, probably closer to 200 now. 
And then, you know, we're over 50 in Nebraska and then Weldworks. I mean, they're just, they're killing it down in Colorado. It's pretty cool. Great thing that you chose to be a part of it, Chad. Yeah, thanks. And uh, when I say you chose, that's yeah. you and the team, because uh, I know from talking to you that, that one of your hesitations about doing things like this is you don't want it to be about you. Absolutely. Um, but yet the organization has to have somebody, you know, speak on their behalf. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the team you mentioned of earlier, but could you tell us who's in the photo with you? Yep. So uh, the gentleman to my right with the sunglasses uh, is Glenn Sisson. And then the gentleman at the other end of the table is Michael Davidson. Um, so they um, really, we're all one company, uh, but we do have Wyoming Malting Company on site. And so Michael and Glenn, uh, really, they, they make all the malt that we then sell to breweries and distilleries around the area. And then uh, all the malt that we use in-house as well. Um, Michael and I have known each other since 2004. We worked together at Enterprise Rent-A-Car in, in Las Vegas. So we uh, remain friends. And yeah, here he is out here. Um, next to Michael is Cameron Karajanis. Uh, he's our newest employee. He came on last July. Um, so um, he's going to learn how to run the still here one of these days. Um, and then next to him, so in between Cameron and myself, is uh, Aaron Mayer. So he's our head distiller, uh, former brewer over at Daniel Marks. Uh, he's been here about a year and a half now. Um, he's also a 20-year uh, retired Air Force vet. And so between you and Aaron, uh, you came from a very corporate background. He came from a very Air Force background. I'm guessing the beards weren't allowed in either of those environments. The beards were not allowed in either one of those environments. So, uh, no, as soon as I moved out here in 2014, it was game on. So, yep. <laughs> it's a, a cool, cool feel to the team. Um, one of the, the things that you guys do that, that I think speaks to how uh, fun uh, you guys are, and I know that's true for lots of different organizations, but you guys did something I've not heard of before. And I'm curious if it was a team idea or if there was a person who came up with it and brought it to you, but you guys did a Corgi Derby. <laughs> yes. So uh, my sister and her husband used to work for us um, and we were sitting around on a Friday evening talking about different ways we could do fundraisers and, and uh, um, Erica was like, it'd be fun if we, you know, race dogs on the same day as the Kentucky Derby and supported an animal shelter and i was like i think we should do corgis and everyone looked at me like i had two heads they're like there's not enough corgis in wyoming to do this race and i said you do not understand corgi owners in wyoming there's there's a lot of corgis out here and they're all proud of those dogs and um we had 32 corgis last year um raised over a thousand dollars for the cheyenne animal shelter and then uh, we were supposed to hold it again this year in may same day as the Kentucky Derby, but so we postponed it until September 5th. So we'll still do it the same day as the, as the Kentucky Derby. Yep. So for anyone who watches this, who's looking for something fun to do when the Kentucky Derby is happening, yep. that's a destination event, I would say. And we do, you know, dress up contest and everything. And, you know, we, we serve mint juleps and we just try and have a lot of fun and raise money for the animal shelter. It sounds like a great combination. Uh, here's another shot, uh, and and what I uh, thought was really cool about this one is the different ways that you guys have used the logo, yep. um, the metal work that you guys have done. Just it's got a really cool vibe to it, um, and then you transfer it in other places. Like I said, lots of cool swag and different stuff going on. Um, so lots of good reasons to come visit. Uh, last photo that we have, uh, the difference here obviously are the people standing next to you. Who's in the shot with you? Yep. So uh, that's my wife, Teresa, in the black shirt, and then uh, my three daughters. Uh, so the oldest daughter is Madeline, and then in front of me is Kirsten, and then uh, in front of uh, Teresa is little Sadie. So, yep, that's our little our little clan. <laughs> and how do they like being in Wyoming versus having been in Vegas? Obviously, you've been here a while, so they're, yep. they're used to it, but do you notice you know, them reacting differently to Wyoming than they did to Vegas? You know, and the only one that really that would have a frame of reference would be Madeline. Um, we, she went to school in Vegas, trying to think, kindergarten, first grade, and second grade. So third grade in Wyoming. Um, you know, when you're in these big metropolitan areas, 
uh, there's just a lot more competition, you know? And so if you're going to do sports, well, you need to pick a sport at a pretty young age. Um, well, moving to Wyoming, a town of 1200, you can learn volleyball, you can learn basketball, you can, you know, do track and you can do multiple sports. And that interaction we think is great. Um, so she's the one that really would remember Vegas and, and man, she loves Wyoming and, and the, the two littles, I mean, this is all they remember and, um, they absolutely love it. You know, on our little homestead south of town, we've got, we're currently up to eight steers right now, a horse, you know, St. Bernard. So we're just trying to live the country life and yeah, the family loves it. And are you, cause we started with the idea of you coming here from, uh, Vegas and corporate America, there was what you thought you were getting into. Um, is it what you thought it was going to be, or has it turned out to be somehow different than what you expected? It's, uh, I mean, it's pretty similar to what we thought it was going to be, or I thought it was going to be, um, you know, uh, working for the world's largest slot machine manufacturer, working for the world's largest rental car company. You take maybe some things for granted, you know, and once you do it on your own, there's, there's no one to fall back on. It's like, oh, well, no, we've, we've got to figure it out. There isn't, there isn't a checkbook that can just fix everything today. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's, you know, one of the big things that's different. Well, Chad, uh, on behalf of anyone who might view this, uh, thanks for what you have done here in Wyoming. I'm sure what you're going to continue to do. Uh, what we'll post along with this are your Facebook uh, page and also your Instagram. I think Ooh. those are the two ways that you stay in touch with people. Yep. So we'll post both of those so they can you know, find out about new product, so they can find out about events like the Corgi Derby. Uh, <laughs> lots of cool stuff that you guys are doing. Cool. That'd be awesome. Thank you for posting that for us. Absolutely. Thanks very much for everything you're doing in the community, Chad. Cheering for you, man. Keep going. All right. Thank you.